Hello and welcome to Brain in a Vat. This is a special episode because Mark will not be co-hosting with me tonight. He's away. Instead, we have one of our frequent flyers, Raja Halwani, and we'll be interviewing Holly Lawford-Smith. Holly, would you like to start with a thought experiment? So imagine a future of our world in which there is no gender, only sex. What does that mean? So there are male and female people, of course, and we call the adults of those people men and women, just like we do now. But there are no norms or expectations about what men or women will be like, whether those expectations are imposed by others or internalized by each person and imposed upon themselves. There is nothing called masculinity because behaviors like chopping firewood or being emotionally stoic no longer cluster together. There's a mixture of male and female people who are emotionally stoic. Same too for femininity. There are still some people who like to present themselves decoratively, experimenting with makeup or clothing, but that's a mixture of male and female too. There are still some unhappy traits, as there always have been in humans. There is some violence, but the violence is not done disproportionately by one sex and not, when sexual, done primarily by one sex against the other sex. There is some passivity and self-effacement, but still there's not a striking clustering of this trait by sex. Perhaps there are some things that one sex or the other tend to do a bit more of, but no one thinks of the sexes as uniquely suited to different things, and no one raises an eyebrow when people of one sex do things that more people of the other sex tend to like or do. So in short, there are just humans here, and the humans are sexed, and everything else, presentation, comportment, behavior, jobs, preferences, hobbies, approaches to intimacy, everything, it's for anyone and everyone. There are many female politicians, CEOs, and astronauts, and many male nurses, kindergarten teachers, and ballerinas. There are no diversity and inclusion consultants. This last part of the thought experiment is a joke. So my question is, in this world, would we need feminism? Would we need a men's rights movement? Would we need a gay rights movement? And would we need trans activism? And if we wouldn't, doesn't this show that all of these movements should get behind the radical feminist project of gender abolitionism? Sounds great. Sounds like a utopia. A question, though, um, some would argue, I, I think Jordan Peterson would be one of them, that such a world is biologically impossible because he thinks that a lot of humans' behavior is determined by their biology and their biology is partly determined by their sex. And yeah. so he, he'd say that there are built-in inherent differences in the sexes which leads them to behave differently, seek different types of jobs, etc. Yeah, it's, it's obviously the sort of familiar line of disagreement that there's this question over exactly how much of sex clustering human behavior is fully explained by biology versus something like socialization or enculturation. It seems to me from what I have read of, you know, the brain science literature or the average differences in traits relevant to work literature, et cetera, et cetera, that what can actually be pinned on biology is just such a minuscule proportion of the differences that we see. So I think we at least have strong evidence that biology does not explain sex differentiation or separation as we know it. I'm open-minded about whether it explains anything at all. So I'm not like a blank slatist. I'm, I'm open-minded. I would say I'm agnostic about whether, what is it, the three brain regions that show strong sex differences could explain a lot of the sort of behavioral choices or whatever. I think that's kind of unlikely, but I'm open to the empirical evidence as it develops. But I think maybe, a, I at least think a strong version of that view, or men just are naturally more violent and there's not much you could do about that unless you really, what, go transhumanist and like dramatically interfere with what the species is like. I don't buy that. Holly, if I, if I can uh, pick up on, what, on Jason's question, and this is just a clarification of what you think about this. So one issue with all the sociobiology, like Jordan Peterson, and of course, more respectable names in sociobiology than Jordan Peterson, one issue is explanatory, which is the one that you have been uh, thinking about. We go to sociobiology in order to explain the differences that we often see clustered around males and females. 
Yeah. But so far as gender abolitionism is a normative position, it's a political moral aspiration. What about the argument that even if sociobiological differences explain a lot about our behavior, they don't dictate it in the sense that we cannot derive normative claims from certain biological facts. And so as far as the gender, gender critical feminism movement is concerned, it's aspirational to a world in which we can overcome them, even if currently they explain a lot about our behavior. What do you, what do you think about this line of thinking? No, no, it absolutely makes sense. I guess I am a re realist in the sense that I do take feasibility, possibility constraints quite seriously. And I think there would be no point in being aspirational about something that just was not realistic given human nature. So, so, I, so I am receptive to those kinds of thoughts. I wouldn't just insist on the normative point no matter what. But I, yeah, so that, I think that's why I do tend to, tend to lean into the thought Catherine McKinnon says something like, can you imagine elevating half the population and denigrating the other and not creating difference? <laughs> like, yeah, so our human history, which has been very sex divided and sexist, has constructed a lot of difference between the sexes, but we should have an open mind about how much of that difference is malleable or could be changed. I do want to be serious about the evidence that some aspects of that just could never be changed. But I, but I, I want us as philosophers to at least be like really using our analytical tools to not be like just assuming that because something is the case, it's locked in biologically or it's innate. I, I want us to be really receptive to, I don't know, maybe we do experiments in living to see how much that thing could change. And then we adjust our expectations about the chances of success in trying to do do things really differently. I really like the question around what percentage of the variability could be explained by biology and what percentage isn't. And, yeah. and that, that seems like an important question to ask. And the Jordan Petersons of the world have assumed that pretty much all of it is explained. And I think it's a exactly. good question to ask. And they just look at, I think, so much of that science or pop science, whatever it is, they just look at the world as it is. So they just say, oh, look, the sexes behave differently or they make different choices. They're not bringing a sort of feminist analysis of 2,000 years of patriarchy or whatever it is and saying what sorts of cultural norms and habits and expectations and beliefs are we bringing into the way we like raise children or set our societies up. They're not, they're just taking things as they are and then being like, oh, wow, these two people are quite different. No kidding. So were slaves and slave owners. You know, I do think a bit more of that sort of critical lens on difference is probably needed. So what I'd like to ask more about is you talk about um, femi the feminist framework and specifically yeah. gender critical feminism. Can you discuss or explain what it is and what the core claim is? Yeah, maybe a good way to understand it is to say that gender critical feminism is a kind of backlash on mainstream feminism. And I think I've never put it like that before. And maybe, maybe we can talk about whether backlash is a helpful word, because it's not that I think it's a backlash in the sense that it's a bad thing. I think sometimes certain sorts of movements or even ideologies in the neutral sense, like some area of philosophy of science, it can just get really caught up in an idea. And then someone needs to come along from the outside and be like, whoa, 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 this idea is stupid. That guy's too influential. He, because he's charismatic, not because his ideas make sense. Let's go back to the guy before. <laughs> Let's carry on from there. That is how I see gender critical feminism. It's the third wave lost its mind, third wave feminism, and everything just went like extraordinarily inclusive, extraordinarily like all of global justice, extraordinary, you know, it just lost its sense of who its constituency was and what it's for. It lost its what would the word be like courage? Like now you have all these mainstream feminists getting paid to write opinion pieces that are quite palatable to the whole of the left. So I see us as a very small group of women that are like, oh my God, like we need an analysis of what's wrong with pornography. And we need an analysis of what's going wrong, you know, with casual sex and what's going wrong, like why we still need feminism, why we should still care about female people. This fight is not over because you mostly solved the wage gap. So I think that's how I see it. It's a re-emergence or resurgence of a female-centered feminism that takes sex seriously, 
And, and a lot of that is really about pushing back or trying to refine the excesses of the sort of third wave liberal intersectional feminist movement. So Holly, can yeah. you say a little bit more about how you think the third wave feminism has gone off the rails in some ways? I know you mentioned intersectionality. Perhaps another reason is you th is they think that the work has been completed when it hasn't been completed yet. So I'm wondering if you can just elaborate on all the ways that you think third wave feminism still requires some sort of pushback from gender critical feminism. Yeah, I guess the thing that I'm most concerned about is the sort of extraordinary explosion of the feminist agenda. So in the sense of what do mainstream feminists think that feminism is and who is it for and what are its concerns? I think if you just took a, yeah, your standard, I don't know, maybe popular, someone who's the sort of influencer type feminist, maybe on TikTok or Twitter or writing it for popular leftist outlets, you'd struggle to find anything that was particularly related to either differences of femaleness relating to the body, right? Things like rape, sexual assault, female-specific medical issues, menstruation, that sort of classic things to do with the female body or to do with the devaluation of femininity, sexist stereotypes, and so on. You'd get a lot of obsessing about disabled black lesbians or whatever. Like maybe that sounds like I'm being a bit melodramatic, but it's almost always like you have to bring in at least one other identity that's not femaleness. You So there's this kind of obsession about multiple aspects of identity all at once. So it's not enough to care about women. It's not enough to talk about females. You have to talk about the six intersecting aspects of identity all at once. And then you have to defer to the most oppressed or defer to the most marginalized. So you're almost always like setting up this pecking order and then finding out who's at the bottom of it and then really focusing all your energies on that group. And of course, we could have a philosophical discussion about all those principles, right? Prioritarianism is, this may be good. There's some things to say back. Okay, focus on the most oppressed when you've solved their problems, move on. But don't be scatterbrained about it, right? Don't be like, whenever the position of the most oppressed shifts day to day, you you completely change your activism because you're just obsessed with the ways tracking the worst one. Also, don't be a fool. So if some group claims to be the most oppressed, but they're actually just like middle-aged white men who are quite wealthy, don't fall for that. <laughs> of course, this relates to the trans issue because I think some of mainstream feminism has fallen for that. And then somehow there's this weird inversion where the people that would be at the top of a seriously drawn hierarchy are assumed to be at the bottom. But I, yeah, so I do think it's this almost developed into this idea that to be female is not enough. We don't deserve our own political movement. Uh, woman alone is privileged, right? So you get this rhetoric about white women or Karens or whatever. So you need to bring these other things in too for legitimacy. Oh, she's a black woman. Okay, we can talk about, we're allowed to talk about black women. We're allowed to talk about trans women, but we're not allowed to talk about women. So yeah, I do think that's really what the gender critical feminist movement is insisting on. It's no, let's start talking about women again, just women, what we all have in common. One of the main points that advocates of intersectionality often like to make is, the, is basically the idea that, well, look, you can't just bring blackness and womanhood and add them to each other, basically, so to deal with black women. So the idea is that the issues that black women have to deal with are not just women's issues, nor are they just black issues, but they are black women's issues. Issues. On the other hand, it seems from your book and from hearing you speak now, it seems that gender critical feminism does want to have some sort of separation of axes. So there is oppression on the axis of sex, there is oppression on the axis of race, and so yeah. on and so forth. And so how, how would a gender critical feminist deal with that kind of point that often advocates of intersectionality make? Yeah. So I should be clear on this point that I'm not necessarily speaking for the gender critical feminist movement when I express my views and skepticism about intersectionality. And I do try to be careful about that in the book because most of the stuff in the book in gender critical feminism that in my last book, it was trying to speak for the movement in a slightly like crowdsourced way. But that stuff on intersectionality is really me being like, hey, we should be like this. Um, please believe me or be convinced by me so that they are slightly idiosyncratic views in saying that I do think that it picks up on a lot of the dissatisfaction that's expressed by gender critical feminists where they really want to retain the language of femaleness they really want to talk about the female body 
and body, embodied experiences that are unique to female people. And they want to refocusing on what we all have in common as women, which is our femaleness and the sorts of experiences that are related to that. On your direct question about the intersectional claim, you're absolutely right. There's this idea that it wouldn't be enough to have an anti-racism movement and a feminist movement focus. So one focus on race, one focus on sex. They both do their job that black woman is taken care of. There's this idea, no, no, her oppression is more than the sum of its parts, or it's somehow, it's like race times sex, not race plus sex. That's the thing that I found so frustrating. And my co-author and I, Kate Phelan, we wrote a paper about this, just trying to read through the literature to find evidence. Like, what? So there's just this claim. There's all this rhetoric about multiplicative oppression and more than the sum of its parts. And there's all these locutions. But there is almost never a good example of something where it is more than the sum of its parts. Like it would not be taken care of by anti-racism movement and feminism movement separately. And I've been doing this for now, I think five or six years, however long I've been teaching the feminism course. So say, say this is in its fifth year, trying to find the best examples I can of genuinely intersectional oppression, not just not just the one plus one, but the one one like most the multiplying. And even then, I'll think I've found one, like the the one I'm using at the moment is Indigenous Australian women. There was a lot of reporting last year in Australia about how they're suffering domestic violence at higher rates because police or communities are reluctant to further raise the incarceration rate of Indigenous men. And so that's interesting, right, because it's a problem in domestic violence that white women or non-Indigenous women wouldn't be facing. But still, the, there's this question, is this, it's certainly something that is happening at the intersection of the two in the sense that it's like you need both the race and the sex to get it. Still, I don't know how to quite mediate this question of, is it more than the sum of its parts? It's, uh, and maybe I just don't even know what the method would be for answering that question. Is it the sum of its parts or is it more than the sum of its parts? Is that a point about experience? What do movements to alleviate oppression have to do with people's experience? Don't they have to do with systems of oppression? It could also be that we're not making finer distinctions between philosophical definitions of what it means to be sex-based oppression versus political uh, approaches to certain problems. And I get the sense when I read the intersection literature that it seems to be mostly oriented towards political activism. And so we have to understand, uh, for example, the the oppression of Black women in a way that is politically astute as opposed to metaphysically obstinate, basically, about certain things or definition. So it could be it could be as simple as making a distinction between the kind of level of abstraction that we're talking about and whether we're talking about pure philosophy versus activism. Of course, some people might reject that. They might say, you know, as a feminist, I reject the idea of having something called abstract philosophy that is not part of the messy world. But, you know, that's, I guess that's part of the conversation. No, I think that's really helpful. And I think maybe that's something that we almost discovered, but we didn't put it in those terms when Kate and I were researching for the paper, because we did categorize, okay, the, these claims are all about experience, it's like what it is like to be multiply oppressed. That's fine. Okay. There's these, these claims are about knowledge. Have you, you have more knowledge if it comes. Okay. And so maybe it was like, we should have called the experience claims or we could have categorized those and said, yeah, there's just a political reason in terms of testimony and recognition and deference and so on to know this stuff, but it doesn't necessarily show that like oppression itself is intersectional. And I also think that the question of the political and the philosophical distinction is really interesting for feminist philosophy, because I suspect maybe a lot of what is going on in the vitriol around this topic is precisely that a lot of feminist philosophers are not making that distinction. And so they're their, their work is they're seeing it as making a political contribution on on trans rights or whatever. And we're trying to have, okay, but what is the ontolo- what's the knowledge claim? What's the ontological claim or whatever? And then we're talking past each other. I really like your view that just because one group of people maybe doesn't have uh, a monopoly on suffering and oppression, that therefore their oppression or suffering doesn't matter anymore. It seems like it should matter just it just matters maybe slightly less, or maybe it matters just as much, but yeah. it isn't as bad as perhaps yeah. another group, but it doesn't it doesn't wipe it out of existence. But I wonder whether there's some problematic implications that you might not want to accept. 
that result from that view. So one of them is David Benatar's claim. So Mm -hmm. David Benatar was on our show to talk about what he calls the second sexism. And his view is that men are oppressed. And generally, when feminists encounter this view, they laugh it away. Because I was trying not to smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the (laughs) the general response is exactly that. But this is the problem. I'll give you some of the examples he uses. So he says, men are far more likely to uh, be the victim of violence than women are. Uh, Men are far more likely to uh, have menial jobs. Men are far more likely to be imprisoned. And he gives a, a lot of these examples. Men are far more likely to be genitally mutilated than women are. So he lines up all these examples. And on your reasoning then, it seems that if you want to say that men are oppressed and that just because their oppression isn't more than some other group, in this case women, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't count and there shouldn't be men's rights activists. But I assume you don't want to accept that implication. And so that seems to follow from your position that if you're not the most oppressed, you can still count. Yeah, so I guess there's going to be this question one step back, a conceptual philosophical question about what we should count as as oppression. So my methodology is certainly not, and actually maybe it couldn't be for anyone, look out at the world, don't know anything about identity categories and just see who's, and now what, who's suffering, who's subjected to violence, that's all theory laden already, right? It's what's the stuff we care about? Or maybe, yeah, arbitrary violence or pain or lack of flourishing, lack of opportunities. Maybe we can fill that in first and then we just look out at the world and see who's experiencing that. And now what, could it turn out to be men? Maybe, right? Because some things are going to be like poverty issues and then there's get, men are going to be well represented in those groups. And maybe, but I suspect if you did that method just from the armchair out, you wouldn't end up with men as the group that you would call oppressed. You might end up with people in developing countries or poor people or, yeah, I don't know exactly, or maybe depends on the political situation of the country. If there's a group that experiences a lot of like marginalization or maybe it's hijra people in India or something, right? So it just seems like the fact that Benishar can offer instances where men suffer or instances where men are badly off it doesn't yet establish oppression, right? And I think the thing the feminists care about is this thing has been systematic. So maybe it's in the ballpark of the kind of thing where it's more like racism and its legacies of, yeah, stolen labor and forced, you know, w- women through history have been literally appropriated. Like you, you, you have to marry and when you marry, you can't work and you can't be raped. So you're just trapped in this dyadic relationship with a man as his service person. That's been a lot of women's history. And it's a lot of women's lives elsewhere in the world still today. That's not the same thing as like some women in some places are suffering, or some women in some places have to get circumcised without anesthesia or whatever. I I like that response, but I think it opens up a different problem for you. If I understand it correctly, what you're implying is that there's not an agent doing it. So men are in these circumstances, right, where they are the victims of violence or they, one of the examples he gives is they they have shorter lives than women on average. They're more likely to be imprisoned, but there's not some grand system that's doing this to them. Maybe that's, I think I didn't quite have in mind whether it's an agent doing it or not, but more, is it men qua men? Is the reason men are in those situations because there are because they are men or because menness is devalued or whatever maybe that's what you mean so i think he would argue that it is the case but but let's put that aside i i think the problem it raises for your view is many would argue that women are not in such a position today that yes, yes. agreed they were at some point where they were oppressed qua women because they're women but today yes. they're not it's incidental if they are. And so and so on that view, then you have an inconsistency between your position and accepting or rejecting David's. No, I, th- I, I think that's a really fair point. I, I, I think it's often overstated this idea that, yeah, that was in the past or like we've, we're, we're done with that now. And I think we're, we tend to be more cavalier about that with women than we do with other groups. We're still talking about the Holocaust and we should be. We're still talking about slavery and we should be. 
women were very much trapped up until what, the 1960s and later in some countries. It's pretty recent history that we we suddenly have our feminism and our women's liberation, even if we do indeed have it. So one question is like when very serious oppression, loss of freedom, exploitation, use for other people's gain has happened in your history as a class or caste, how long are you allowed to keep bringing that up for? <laughs> and what are the sort of structural implications of that for, you know, what, what society is like or what people's attitudes are? Okay, that's a good question and we could talk about that separately. The other thing is just whether it's actually true that women were oppressed but are no longer, even if we focus on specific countries like Australia. And I think the thing that I would want to talk more about there is really in the ballpark of sexual and beauty. <clears throat> Sorry is sexual and beauty objectification. So I think there's something very strange going on where one class of people is taken to be roughly equal in society, but then people go home and masturbate to her extraordinary degradation. So she's an equal in the office, but then she's an object for men to fuck in your private life and you're literally rewiring your brain by excessive pleasure on what some people and maybe me would call a form of hate propaganda. And that's all. Imagine if we did that for black people. Oh yeah, you're equal and you're in my workplace. But when I go home, I'm going to watch slavery videos. That's sorry. That is really messed up. And I can't think of any other social group where we do that or where there's, yeah, still a, would there be a billboard in Times Square with a black person picking cotton or whatever? That is just so insane. So I do think there is still a really serious, at least, problem and need for feminism, whether or not you want to call that problem oppression or whether you want to pick out how different that current problem is from the historical stuff that was going on. It's interesting that you bring up the question of masturbation because I think sexual desire is very unique in the way it makes people behave. If you look at the example of gay men, yeah. a man, for instance, can deal with another man in the context of a work environment as an equal. But if, yeah. they, if he has a crush on him, he can go home, fantasize and masturbate about the guy, reducing him also to a sexual object. Part of the history of the oppression of women is also we haven't, we don't know enough yet about how sexual desire works in women versus men. And of course, we get all the sociobiological literature, but it's also interesting. Some of the books that have been written about women's sexual fantasies also seem to reduce men to, but, but I agree with you that it's not, it's not systemic in the way that it has been for women from the part of men. But I wanted to go in a slightly different direction, which is to go back to Jason's original question about the, and, and Benatar's question about oppression. So I think one of the examples that Benatar uses with some force is the idea that men throughout history have been the subject of physical violence and wars. Yeah. They get attacked, they get beaten up and so on and so forth. Consider people who accuse white supremacy to be behind it, even if the agents who perpetrate certain crimes are not white themselves. We have seen this with respect to attacks on Asian people in the United States, where a lot of the perpetrators are actually black men. But the idea is that ultimately the culpable party is white supremacy because it has led to a situation where certain segments of society end up committing certain things that other segments are not. So for someone like a gender critical feminist, for example, we often hear the idea is that men are as much oppressed by patriarchy in their own ways as women are. Someone, for example, who looks to gender abolitionism might say, look, under a future or under a kind of utopian society in which there is no gender, men themselves will also be liberated from this kind of gender stereotypes, which, which also leads a lot of men to think that they have to commit violence, to think that they have to go to war all the time, to constrict them, to volunteer to fight. So when we talk about feminism or gender critical feminism, we do have women are oppressed as a sex class and they tend to be oppressed at the hands of men, but also perhaps the ultimate system is a sort of way of thinking about the roles of men and women, which has come to be called patriarchy. And I'm wondering whether something similar can be said also for arguments like Benatar's so that we would have a sort of conciliatory type of feminism that doesn't necessarily argue for the oppression of women by also saying that there is no such thing as oppression for men. But it's interesting. I think there's two things I would want to respond to separately. You're right that like most of the violence is, it's not just that men are most subject to it, it's that men are or most the perpetrators of it, but they perpetrated against men. The question is, is that qua men 
And I think not. I think this, again, it's this McKinnon style feminist point that like men are fully human. And the question is, are women there yet? When men are targeting each other for violence, it's not because they are men, right? It's because they are in the enemy motorcycle gang or because they are from the wrong nation and they're going to war. Or it's, So it's like they're fully human, but there's violence in this story about how they compete for resources or how they like pursue their conception of the good, whether that's their own as an individual or at the behest of their state. So I just think that's maybe an important point to keep in mind when it comes to thinking about whether that violence can be classed as oppression. Then on your second point about gender abolitionism, I do think that's right. And maybe this, I can make a sort of slight concession here about the second wave feminist movement, because it's true that the gender studies people have something right when they say gender norms hurt everybody. That is true. The masculinity is highly constraining for men as well. And second wave feminists, radical feminists in particular, they could give a shit about men. <laughs> so they care about the victims. So they, they, their whole thing was to throw their energies behind the primary victims of this system. So what is what has the construction of femininity done to women's full personhood? What does it do to condition a person into passivity and self-effacement and the service of others? What does that do to her flourishing? But it's true that like we got so caught up, we in the historical lineage of that kind of feminism, we got so caught up in freeing women and we made so much progress, like what gender nonconformity and the way women can look now and what they can wear and what they could do. We weren't doing that work for men. And by the way, neither should we have to. Right? <laughs> so it's not women's job to, to do that. But it's interesting that there was not a parallel men's liberation from masculinity movement running alongside. I think there were some like stunted efforts at that during the second wave, but they didn't really go anywhere. So we do end up at this place where we've got like a pretty, pretty liberated group of women, but then a group of men who are still like basically dressing the way they have for the last 500 years and still adhering to lots of the same norms and still quite constrained in their sexualities and intimacy and so on. I think it's true that we could do more now, or at least the way I see it, like the gender studies project of leaning in more to the ways in which the feminist project in whatever guys can be good for men too, the bell hook style move, as I think of it. I think that's fine. I just don't want them to tell me I'm not allowed to do my kind of feminism, which is really still focusing on what I see as the primary victims. But that does take us all the way back to the thought experiment at the start, right? Because I suggested gender abolitionism is good for everyone. We wouldn't need men's rights activism. It's good for men. Men should be fully human, the full spectrum of whatever traits appeal to them. And it shouldn't be that a little boy wants to grow his hair long and wear a dress and suddenly that's pathological and he needs treatment. That's just normal self-expression for someone who happens to be male. So the big pink elephant in the room is what is this mean for <laughs> trans people? And yeah. it seems to me like there's maybe two definitions of what a woman is that you've been floating. And, I, and I'm curious if we were to set up cases, which way you would go if you were forced. So yep. the one definition that you might be thinking of is that a woman is just a biologically female person. Human. Yep. The other definition seems to revolve around oppression. So the idea is a woman is the kind of person who suffers from the patriarchy, who is oppressed by the pa patriarchy in certain ways, traditionally. And you might set up cases that force you one way or the other. So the trans case is an interesting case because it it does pre it does present that watershed. So yeah. suppose you've got a male-bodied person who to society is totally qualitatively identical to a woman and is oppressed in the way a woman is oppressed by society. Do they count? In other words, do gender critical feminists think that that person's suffering matters as much as someone who's suffering in the same way and isn't oppressed in the same way, but also happens to have a vagina? do those oppressions count just as equally or not? Because if they don't, then it seems that the vagina is doing the work. It seems that mm. biology is doing the work and not the oppression. So I, I, I want to know which way you go when forced. For me, this is a terminological question almost, although, yeah, feel free to push back if you think it's more than that. I think it's more useful for feminism to insist that a woman is an adult human female and there's nothing more to being a woman, nothing more or less than being female. 
I think that's the more liberatory message that gets her more free of gender norms and expectations and stereotypes and so on. And that message is just not compatible with, you know, something like the Haslinger style idea that like a woman is a person in a particular position in a social hierarchy. I don't think we should be woman abolitionists. I don't think that it's like a category that we want to like never have that concept or word in the future. I think that I just use the two synonymously, like the women are the female, the adult female people. And we probably do need both words. Every language has those words. And so that suggests that they, they are useful. That question about the terminology and how to use woman is still separate from your question of the trans woman in that really good case, unusual case, but good, good case that you mentioned, she does seem to have something in common with women. So should feminists care about that? And I, I have to say, I think no, because the constituency, it'll be good for that trans woman when feminists fight against, you know, the what the catcalling, let's say, or sexual harassment of female people, because that trans woman looks female, so it will end up benefiting her inadvertently. But am I fighting for her? This is interesting. I usually misgender hypothetical trans women and somehow I'm being very polite in this moment. But yeah, they have something in common, but that's not that. And it's not feminism's job to fight for that person, but, it, but their fight will benefit that person. Just to be clear, Holly, that you also, you're not towing this line only when it comes to trans people. You're also towing this line when it comes to any other group that is not female, correct? Absolutely. I just, you don't, yeah. don't will come across as necessarily uh, exclusionary to, to the ire of some people. Oh There's, yeah, but I am. But I am. Like, <laughs> the reasons why you're saying this have nothing to do with the trans people as such, but have everything no, to do with like, the kind of group. Femaleness. Are, well, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. No, that's right. I think I've, I've got a slight sensitivity because I think we and it's probably as a result of Judith Butler, although Kate Phelan's writing about this and it might, the history might go back further. Somehow at some point in feminism, we just got absolutely obsessed with inclusion. And so it's now another one of my bugbears that like we shouldn't knee-jerk accept that exclusion is bad and inclusion is good because sometimes they're not. And so that's just why I laughed a little bit when, yeah, no, I am exclusionary and I'm just like standing by that at the moment. But you're absolutely right. The whole point is the, the people who have been treated in this way. And the reason why it's female people, it's control of sexuality, it's control of reproduction. It's putting those people with that trait in the service of men. That's the thing feminism or at least feminism of this kind should care about. So it excludes anyone who isn't female. It's not targeting trans, trans people. And actually it's bringing in trans men and non-binary female trans people. It's all females. As an aside, the reason why this case comes to mind is I spent a few months in Thailand and perhaps it's an unusual place in that trans women are just very difficult to tell apart from yep. cisgendered women yep. or what you would just call women. Yep. It's, it's yep. very, very hard. So those kind of cases come to mind. Good I think point. what's yeah, okay, what's, so. what's very interesting is whether, because you talked about whether women are oppressed qua women, in other words, because they're women. And yeah. I think that just sounds incorrect. It seems like in the trans case, that illustrates it well. It's not that people are being oppressed because they're women. It's because people are being oppressed because there's the system of beliefs around how women should behave and their value and their worth and how they should be treated. But all of that can be superimposed onto trans women who are qualitatively identical. And so but it's... People People, the word woman, as you use it there, what do you mean? Who is it that is subject? Do you just think it's anyone who, who is it that is supposed to be like that? So I'm not making empirical claims about the way the world works. I'm not saying that trans people are oppressed in the same way that women are oppressed, but I'm just giving you a hypothetical situation. So I'm, I'm saying to you, imagine there's a person who happens to have a yeah. penis who looks to the world exactly the same as persons who don't have penises. And so the, the world treats them the same way. In that case, surely you must say that you should be fighting for that person too. No. <laughs> but that's weird, right? That's because what, But no, that's not because, and this is why I'm asking you, what's the explanation, right? Is it that anyone who looks female is thought to be a really good carer or should be heterosexual and paired up with a man and being his house slave, right? Is that the view? No, I think the story would be it's 
female people who are assumed. Why? For some reasons to do with what their psychology is supposed to be like or they're innately suited. Whatever the story is, that story ultimately is about female people. And of course, you can make a mistake and someone who really has taken great lengths to look female is going to get caught up in that treatment. But the ultimate explanation of why they're being targeted or treated that way is about femaleness. And that's why I think the feminist project is about femaleness, even though it will happen to work out well and help that person. It's not for them, but it will help them. Okay, but let's drill down on that, right? So those beliefs about how females should behave in the world, that they should be caring people, that they should have a heterosexual relationship with a man, etc., those yeah. those beliefs don't seem to have anything to do with a woman's vagina, with her what you call femaleness. It seems yeah. that they've just got to do with a system of patriarchal beliefs about the way people with vaginas should behave and how they should be treated. But it's not the vagina itself that seems to matter. It's this collection of beliefs. And that collection of beliefs could be superimposed onto someone without a vagina. And then it seems like they're suffering all the same oppression that you're saying that women suffer. Yeah. Do you think that black liberation should be for tanned people? I think like that- Maybe it sounds flippant, but I'm just saying, of course we can do things where somebody looks Jewish or somebody looks black or they have features of an oppressed group. I just don't think it's very plausible to say now the movement is for that person too. No, it will be good for that person, but it's not for that person. Consider in, in dealing with the cases that you're giving, Jason, it's interesting to also think of hypothetical situation. For example, if a man is, say, catcalling or throwing slurs at a trans woman who is walking down the street thinking that she is a female woman, right? What would happen to the situation if the man were to know that that's actually a trans woman? Would the dishing behavior change? Because I think an answer to that question, and of course, to some extent, the answer is going to be empirical, but I think an answer to that question also helps to help us think about what is the target of the oppression and, and, and what type of oppression is being dished once the target is known to be what it is, basically. There are parallel cases to it with sexual orientation. For example, if I'm attracted to someone to all appearances looks like a man, basically, but I come to find out that they're actually a trans man, so they have not had bottom surgery, as the saying goes. For a lot of gay men, I think for the majority of them, they will change their sexual desire towards them. Now, of course, in the cases you're giving, we're talking about, you know, the way, behavioral ways towards the other person, but I think it might still be an interesting thing to think about the counterfactual situation. If I remember correctly, and this is not from my own writing, it's from someone getting angry on Twitter, but if I remember correctly, I have an example in my last book about a trans woman in a taxi, so an Uber share, and the um, assumption being that like women are shit at navigation, so sh she won't know anything, but then she says to the other male passengers, oh, no, no, I'm a trans woman. And my intuition about that case is that they immediately stop with the sexist assumption because those are brain assumptions. The male brain is better geared for navigation and map reading or whatever. So I think she could just say, oh, no, I'm a trans woman, and that would immediately stop the assumption. Someone on Twitter was like, oh, that is so stupid and outrageous. Of course, that's not the case. And I, you know, and I'm open to that too. I think it is an empirical question. Would that treatment change if the person reveals their, their sex? But yeah, for, again, just from my armchair, I suspect that it would. And I suspect that things like catcalling or yeah, physical intimidation in public, that's why still keep women in line. If the person was known to be male, those rules are quite different. Yeah, but good question about what, how that would actually play out empirically. I really like the counterfactual. <clears throat> I think that, I think it's a good, it's a good answer. By the way, my personal position is not that I'm a trans activist, but, but I, I don't believe in social groups at all. So I want, oh, to, okay. I want to deny the existence of women and of trans women. So my personal view is that you can't construct, a, I think what you call a class, from biological features. I don't think you okay. can construct a class from any set of features, but but I'm pretty confident, especially that you can't construct them from biological features. So I want to deny women for that reason, that they're a class. Of course, they are persons with vaginas, but I just don't want to group them in that way. 
and say that as a group, they have certain characteristics or a certain experience or a certain past. I want to say that only individuals can have experiences, not classes. Is this ameliorative? What's your goal in saying that, given that there has been like slavery or there has been like, I don't know, a control of abortion or whatever? Do you, is it a, so are you saying, no, we shouldn't have classes because that's been the basis of social hierarchy and I'm anti hierarchy? Or are you actually saying, what, there wasn't? Or the, no, it's a metaphysical yeah, what you, claim. It's a metaphysical, metaphysical claim. Metaphysical, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, not, I'm not making a, a claim about the way society should be structured or that there shouldn't be women's rights organizations. I just think the terms they're using don't refer to anything in the world. So I, I don't okay. think okay. there Got is it. a class of women, but it may still have utility to talk as if there is. And it may be that a society works out better if you have women's rights organizations than if you don't because of a series of false beliefs that society has about women. So I, I think a lot of this arises from false beliefs. And given the system of false beliefs, you may need to act as if those beliefs were true and, and work within the system of false beliefs. But in reality, I don't think that there are such things as women as a group. Come the class, Raja might want to say something about this on sexual orientation, but I've just been reading some of his and others' work for teaching about, you know, the essentialist versus the social constructionists on this point. I would have thought the the line would be, of course, we can have that word and we can have that class or caste. The question is just as whether it's a socially constructed category or a real one that tracks some carves nature at its joints or has some metaphysical reality to it. So that wouldn't quite be a reason to insist there are only individuals, it would just be a reason to give a certain sort of social constructionist analysis of the category label. I want to deny that social constructions construct anything. So I, I, I deny that anything results from a social construction. The, the Surlian view of social constructionism is that you get connected beliefs in things and that's yeah. sufficient to bring them into existence. So Yes, and you deny that. Yeah, yeah, I deny that. I don't think that see, see. not work. Okay. So I, I want okay. to say there's no, there's nothing objective in the world, whether that genesis is through social construction or through some objective observation of that thing. I, I want to deny okay. that these similarities are sufficient to to generate groups or classes or castes. Okay. No, that's interesting. I think I'm because I used to work in the collective action literature, and I think I just believe in social constructions. I just think they have a different status to, to the things that are real, like metaphysically real. Yeah, I see what I, that's an interesting position. I would have to think more about it. By the way, that applies to trans and gay people too. Um, yeah. 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 I, I want Raj and I are both gay, and I want to deny that we have anything in common at all. We don't speak <laughs> with the same people, Raja. So oh, I, <laughs> I don't think we have any one partner in common between us. So I, <laughs> I want to deny that that we're part of a group. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now that's a more radical view than I thought you had in mind. So that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, there's a question I've been itching to ask if I wanted, if I could go back to the original thought experiment. Jason, whether you deny social groups or not, they exist, God damn it. You just have to come to grips with that, basically. For all intents and purposes, we have to deal with that. There are gays, there are women. <laughs> anyway. Sorry for that. In the, in the thought experiment, Holly, you, you asked the question at the end, whether if we had gender abolitionism, whether we would still need to have a movement for, for gay rights or, uh, or whether there would still be a movement for trans rights, for example. Yeah. And I remember there was, a, I'm sure you've read the essay, but there was an old essay by Cheshire Calhoun. I can't remember the title of it, but basically she argues that oppression on the basis of sex is very much different than oppression on the basis of sexual orientation. So she has this thought experiment where you can imagine a possible world similar to the one you are imagining in which there is no sex-based oppression. But in that world, if a man is sexually attracted to another man, oh my God, all things would fall apart. Imprison them, put them in jail, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm trying to see whether you think if we do have gender abolition, does that mean that we would have also abolished oppression on the basis of sexual orientation? It doesn't seem to be and what implications that has for oppression on the basis of trans identification, basically. No, that's really good. I don't know if I've read the paper. I would have to check. So just off the cast, I'm assuming that heterosexuality as prescriptive is a gender norm. And I guess this is following from the some of the second wave era and later discussions about compulsory heterosexuality. 
But I think there is probably just in nature, naturally, heterosexuality and homosexuality, there, there are these desires and dispositions. But I think it's a strong gender norm and has been stronger in the past that we should all be heterosexual and women, yeah, should be kind of like, what is that, conscripted into the service of men somehow, and that includes sexual service. I am assuming that once that expectation falls away, as part of my imagining about gender norms and expectations fall away, you would have something like these desires and dispositions just being facts about people that no one cared about. And if no one cared about them, it just could not be the case that homosexuality was deeply stigmatized. So I would have to read the details of the Calhoun thought experiment to see wh whether I disagreed with something in that. Uh, and maybe you can say something where you think that stigma could come from such that it wouldn't be dependent on sex and expectations about male people being attracted to female people. Yeah, maybe there's something religious to do with sex itself. Or, But again, why would it pick out men rather than men and women? Yeah, I think I'm just struggling just, yeah, for now to try to figure out how that could be the case without the background stuff to do with gender norms. My thought was basically, if we, we can think of a world in which there aren't any of these gender norms, but yeah. the question arises, would there be any norms in that world at all, basically? Is it possible that those norms might actually apply to homosexual and heterosexual sexual desires or some sort of gender identity? Because you, when you gave your thought experiment, you said that in that world, Adults would also be called men and women, basically. Yeah. And it struck me as interesting why we would in that world continue to use the word man and woman. Of course, we have to look into the history of, of the words and all this. If in that world, people, adults would continue to be called men and women, then you can see how some people might also say, look, I'm of a male sex, but I would like to identify as a woman. Of course, your argument is going to be, they have nothing to go on for which to make this identification. But it's interesting that you can have the male and the female, the labels man and woman, and that seems to just open the door slightly for potentially having trans identification that is, which would itself engender certain norms about it. I see what you're asking, but I think it's, I think is deflationary the right view? Like, I'm just channeling Alec, Alex Byrne here. He would just say the words man and woman literally just distinguish the children from the adults. And they do that in every language. There's nothing more to it than that. And the, the feminist once you've gotten rid of to be a woman is to be nothing more or less than being an, an adult human female and to be a girl, to be a, a juvenile, or whatever, human female, be whatever you like, be however you like. There's just nothing left for the would-be trans person to claim because they could only be claiming femaleness and juvenileness or adultness. And that's all false because they're male. <laughs> so yeah, either they're wrong and just making a kind of strange claim and then we would think about how we want to handle that claim in the utopia and would there even be claims like that that's another question i have if it's bodily as some of like transsexualism has been then you might think it still exists in the utopia like that because some people do just want to change their sex but for anything that is what they now describe as being about gender or as you say i think this came up in the recent book by ray briggs and br george that it's like something to do with a social category of its own. Like it named man and woman, that that has some like cultural baggage to do with it. And people can just feel strongly about belonging to that social category. And maybe that's what, what um, Jason, you mean about these reified social groups. People just then, they get interested in them. But in my utopia, there, there could be no such thing. It has no content. And I think that's why I really struggled with their their view because they say people feel so strongly about the social category membership, but then they deny that that kind of has any feminist implications given what people think those categories mean. So just a question whether there's an internal contradiction in your view. So you're, you're pushing the view that women have been oppressed qua woman. And yep. so we, we really do need to understand what woman means and we need to understand the roles that women have been forced into over time. But at the same time, this ideal utopian future that you would like is a future where there is no property associated with either a man or a woman that's distinct um, between the two. So except for sex. Except for sex. Except, yeah. Ex except yeah. that they have different genitalia. More than that, right? Yeah. But Whatever sex is, it's more than genitalia. 
but it's sure, 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 chromosomes okay. or whatever it is. Yeah, but so I'll I'll grant all of that. That's fine. But isn't there a tension then between trying to remember the past, and so having very firm views on what it means to be a woman today that you that that laden onto you is this history of oppression, versus wanting a future where women are unshackled from that past altogether and men are unshackled from the past of being members of a patriarchy? I don't see the tension. And again, just from thinking about other social groups, yeah, imagine like Jewish people come up with a really positive self-conception. We are, we are fully human. We have this great religion and culture. We are strong. And we will never again be told that we are vermin or whatever, like as happened in, in, during the Holocaust. So we keep in mind that other people have denigrated our full humanity and we hold a positive self-conception at the same time. But lest we forget that it's possible for other people to do this to us, let, let's let's bear in mind the, the full horror and capacity of humanity to create social hierarchy and let's just remain on guard. Again, this might just relate to our feelings about social groups, but I don't personally see a problem in women achieving women's liberation in the sense of like full collective self-determination. What does it mean to be a woman? Nothing more or less than being female. Here we are, the happy female people, but we also remember back when we could be raped with impunity in a marriage or whatever, and we won't let that happen again. We're going to remain on guard and we're going to teach women's studies so that we forever remain on guard. Those things seem compatible to me.